It's, it's uh, really wonderful to be before you. I'm, I'm Luke Micklack, the pastor of Family Ministries here at Easton. So welcome or welcome back or welcome again, whatever the case might be for you. We're so glad that you're here. So as we think about Vacation Bible School this year, today is really a celebration and really even a continuation because this is what's true. I, I said this in the early service. I think it's true that ki- I think kids are a little spoiled about VBS, right? Five whole days to come and to hear about God, a connected idea and theme all throughout the week to build on itself and to hear exactly what God uh, wants to communicate to us. What, what an awesome way to set aside time, right, to hear from God. And so really what I want to do is just like go over some of the things that we learn and then continue on taking the next step forward into what God has to say to us. First day, uh, well, let me start at the, the whole overall thing. Uh, Spark Studios was the theme Uh, What it communicated was really simple, that God is creative and that he made us to be the same. Really, it's just that a creative God designed a plan to save us through Jesus, and he empowers us to follow him, that God's a marvelous creator. And in every way, that first day really summarized everything, right? We think about creation and how God made everything, but sometimes it stops there. We say, okay, God's really creative. That's really cool. He may look at all the things he made. But like to invite you, like look outside and see all the wonderful, amazing things that he made. We can't help but say wow to what God did. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with the things that he made. The second day was all about how God designs people, realizing not just that he made us, but that every single part of our lives is strung together. I loved to use this example with the kids. I think it works for us too. That much like a song, it can be a collection of notes, but it takes someone with a real understanding, with a big picture plan of what the notes should be strung together, all creating a song, a piece of music, and a masterpiece. This is how God interacts with us, that he designs he uses us in our, in our lives every second of every day to accomplish his plan and to put it in motion. Then some of the really cool stuff, even beyond realizing this awesome great big plan, is seeing that plan develop and seeing how God used Jesus in it. The third day was all about Jesus coming and actually setting that creative plan in motion, this big picture, this big problem that we are in need of a savior. And so a king came. One who was unlike anyone else, but actually Jesus came to, to be this plan. And so day four came, realizing just how that is, that Jesus came to die and to rise again to fulfill this plan and give us an opportunity to say yes to God and no to sin. And so day five came and realizing now, okay, because of all that Jesus has done, because of the, his role in, in making me and then designing my life, that we can actually take part in God's plan for us. We can actually take part in God's plan for us. And so that was the story of the church and how it began and realizing this incredible movement of people, individuals that were called out of something that was ordinary, normal, and into something that was truly divine and a plan that was unlike anyone ever imagined, right? Seeing God do incredible things all because they were obedient to the creative God. And so that's really a way to summarize this entire week was to see how we are called to obey our marvelously creative God. The verse of the week was Ephesians 2.10, and we can see all this play out just right before our eyes in this verse. We see that we're made by God. We are his handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do we see that we are made by God for a purpose. And we acknowledge in every way, uh, I, I like to use this example as well, that someone made this phone for a very specific purpose. We think of it to make calls or to use apps or, or whatever it might be. But sometimes we miss the fact that we too have a specific purpose, that God made us, our creator, with that specific purpose in mind. So it would be as if, I would take my phone home to build a new piece of furniture, using this as my hammer, my wrench, my screwdriver. Not only would it not work very well, but it would be absolutely destroyed. The same is really true about ourselves, that God's given us a perfect purpose to know him, to love him, to live with him, and to enjoy him. 
that in every way this is what we're called to, to give honor, credit, and glory to God. And so this is really everything. To see how God expresses his creativity through each one of us, not just by saving us, not just by making us, but then from that point on, designing our lives in such a way that we can participate, we can take part in God's own creativity if we obey that marvelously creative God. So I think about the way that God works and really all the mysterious ways, and I can't really think of a better example than one that I experienced myself. Did you ever notice how God sometimes works things together in such a way that's unexpected? It's true that in a lot of ways, these kind of divine appointments happen, whether it's little things, conversations, relationships, friendships, whatever it might be. But the truth is there that God really does accomplish great things through these different small events, stringing them together in our lives. This example is is one that I think is good. It's hard to tell, though, so excuse me. When my first son was born, a lot of you know he was born with a genetic defect um, that made it difficult for him if he wasn't eating. Uh, It's not a difficult fate now at this point to manage as he just has to eat regularly. So it's a pretty, you know, what a bummer that my little boy gets to eat basically whenever. Um, So that's, you know, oh no. Um, But, and you know, he's doing really well. uh, But uh, those first few days were really difficult. We were having the typical struggles of trying to figure out how this all works, how to get a baby to eat. Um, And in that struggle, we eventually got to the point where he became exhausted and finally fell asleep after not really eating anything at all. And so at that point, what we thought was a success was actually him in danger. We just didn't know um, that he was actually fatigued at that point. And so for him, that, that meant danger. And so it was then that God really stepped in, right? This divine appointment, just an example of some of the things that God does. And we're going to look at another example in a second, but it was the middle of the day. It didn't really make a whole lot of sense why it was that we got a new nurse, but we did. It wasn't a staff change. It wasn't like everybody was switching or checking up different rooms. It just, I still don't really know if it was an accident or what, but a new nurse that wasn't working on our case had come in and noticed that something was a little bit off. It was through her efforts that we found out that there really was a problem. If it wasn't for that Whatever happened, I still don't actually know the details, why it was that she came into our room, but if it wasn't for that strange happenstance, I I really do think either my son would have been really impaired or we might have even lost him in the hospital. And so from that point on, doctors were able to take really awesome care of our son, and we were able to really enjoy his life so far, right? This really, like, small interjection, right, this small moment of things lining up in such a way that it doesn't really make logical sense. It doesn't really seem to connect. And yet at the same time, we see that God works together things in our lives in a mysterious way, right? It might not be this dramatic thing like I experienced, maybe even uh, a little bit frightening, but the truth is that it really does happen all the time, that God cares in a very intimate way about how our lives play out, the things that we do, the relationships that we have. And so being in tune with these interruptions, right, these ways that God interacts with our lives has everything to do with how we obey him. The story that we're looking at really is the same. We remember our VBS lessons. We went through this course of seeing the stories of the Bible develop from Uh, all the way from how Jesus came through this story about the church, right? These special people who were actually just ordinary people, but God made special. When he called them out of what I said earlier, something ordinary to obey and devote themselves to Jesus, his teachings, to each other, to caring for each other and loving. So we're continuing that story, seeing the church develop into something more, to see Uh, This group of people who, when you go back to the original language, all the word means is is someone who's called out, someone who's called, like I said, to be something from something ordinary or normal to something else. And so we see that group of followers doing extraordinary things, confusing people, confounding governments, and all kinds of crazy things, all because God had a plan. We know that the church wasn't at this point in any way, really, even today, right? It's not a building. We we know it's not a meeting, and then we know it's not a club. 
but instead this group of people that God called for something more. So like I said, we're just continuing, picking up where we left off for VBS, seeing how Jesus came, how he lived, how he died, how he rose, and then he commissioned. How that commissioning came with a plan. It started out in one place in Jerusalem and then launched from there. That this was always God's intention, not just to see one city changed, but to see the whole world. And this was really the exciting part. To the ends of the earth, Jesus said, that the church would spread, sharing wherever they went the truth about Jesus, that he came to bring hope, life change, and ultimately to save people from a destiny of death. And this is what the church was all about. The church began, the Holy Spirit came and empowered people to do extraordinary things, to speak in languages and dialects that they didn't actually know, to, to again, to, to do incredible miracles, healings, all kinds of things to prove that this God that we serve is real, that he actually cares, and that he knows each one individually, intimately. And as the church grew more and more, people recognized Jesus for who he said he was, a king, someone who came. But unlike any other king, he came to serve, to love, and even more so to, again, to reverse that destiny of death, to give us new life because of his own sacrifice on the cross. They recognized him as the only hope for this problem of sin, that people were separated from God for forever, but we needed a way to him. However, through the direct results and actions of individuals and groups of people seeking to destroy the church, that was spread thin. They were separated from each other. This tight-knit group that was all about loving each other found themselves in different regions, different places, scattered every which way because of these individuals. However, in their efforts to squash and destroy this group of people, they did exactly what God intended to do. Have you ever realized that that very dispersion, right, when it became a dangerous thing for Christians to be in Jerusalem, they spread out to the known world. One person in particular ended up in a place he never would have. And so this is where we join our story. You're welcome to turn with me or read the verses behind me in Acts chapter 8, and we'll be starting in verse 26 in a bit, talking about this person, Philip. Earlier in the book of Acts, Philip was identified and chosen to be one of the people that would care for these neglected widows. They were people that came to faith but had no way to provide for themselves. And so Philip was chosen because of his relationship and closeness with God to be a behind-the-scenes guy. He was someone that was selected for a task to serve individuals, care for their needs, and his position was about preserving unity. It was about keeping people uh, safe and loving them. But something happened to throw him away from his job description, from his expectations. He clung to what he knew to be true. So I'm going to back up just a little bit in verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah. That's Jesus there. We see this incredible circumstance, right? This person found himself first trying to take care of individuals, a small group of people, maybe even large, we don't know for sure, but enough to, to say that it was behind-the-scenes work, right? It was things providing for people's needs, um, doing things like DoorDash, I suppose, would be a good way to equate it now. That, that was kind of what his job was, making sure people were fed, taken care of, their needs were met. But then he found himself in a season that was unlike any other, that he found himself in northern Israel in a region called Samaria, this place was a little bit different from where he was, but something happened there as well. This incredible place where, <clears throat> where something was happening and God was working. So let's read verse 26 together and see where our story starts. This incredible example of someone who's obeying the creative God and then witnessing God's creativity by the way that he interacted. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So like I said, Philip was previously in Samaria. This place was uh, successful. Samaria in every way was kind of one of the first places outside of Jerusalem that really grabbed hold of the truth about Jesus. 
There were people that were coming to faith, miracles being performed. Jesus' own followers, his disciples were present in that area, doing incredible work to make sure that people were really hearing truth about Jesus. And Philip was there doing it himself. He was thrown into a situation that was different from what he expected, and then he experienced the season of incredible success that he felt called by God to be ministering and serving in this area, seeing people's lives changed, the joy that comes from seeing God working in these transformed lives. It, it can't be understated. But then God called him to just leave by himself. It doesn't say to take a bunch of people and split up. It doesn't say to grab some of your dearest followers or your, your, your greatest friends in this area. Now that you've seen God's great success, now let's see what God's going to do down south. No, God called him to leave by himself. He was seeing countless lives changed. And from that point on, it was clear that God's obvious direction was that Philip was to leave that successful, fruitful effort to go somewhere else. How confusing. But it was no accident that the church fulfilled God's plan and the commission that he set. It was God's deliberate purposes and his creative plan. But even more than taking those two things and then being obedient, obeying that creative God that allowed them to be witnesses of what God was doing. Already, Philip had gone through these seasons, first of learning, of growing, of thriving, but now, one of loneliness and complete uncertainty, um, Luke was the writer of the book of Acts, the same person who wrote the gospel of Luke. And so we see it wasn't his job. He, he was very much a, a detailed person. And so he, he didn't feel when he wrote this, I, I believe, in the way that he wrote it, uh, to be kind of the how people were feeling kind of writer, like this omniscient narrator. But instead, he liked to record facts, he liked to record details and places and things. And so, however we can't see Philip's reaction, I think we can place ourselves into the situation to feel confused almost in his place. He might have been obedient, but we can't help but question, God, are you sure you know what you're doing? There's success here. This is a season of excellent work, and yet you want me to leave by myself, to go somewhere where it's uncertain, to go somewhere where it's dry, did you notice it was a desert road? Not only is it barren and, and not even a, a pleasant place to be, but you want me to go by myself there? However, what allowed Philip to experience God's creative plan was his obedience. It'll be a theme throughout the rest of this story. In fact, in the very next verse, we see Philip's response. Although we might not hear what's in his head, we can see. Verse 27, so he started out. I think the original language is even better. It just says, he got up and went. He got up and went. I don't know if that meant he packed his bags. Maybe he literally just left. I have no idea if he said his goodbyes or if he you know, said farewell to the church that was growing in Samaria, but he went south. And from that point on, he was looking for something he didn't even know. All he knew was to go. He started out on his way. He met an Ethiopian eunuch. He met someone an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candake, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. On his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. We'll pause there. This really incredible circumstance, right? This um, questionable and very surprising just happenstance, right? Coincidence? No way, right? It can't be a coincidence, in fact, this person that he ran into was the very reason that God called him to go south. <clears throat> this person was very unique. And in a lot of ways, we see this really incredible thing that's true about the church, that from the very beginning, God's plan wasn't to just include one small group of people, one ethnicity, one uh, tiny cluster of culture, but instead to begin a movement of people that were called by God to follow him, that's the most diverse, the most global movement in human history. It's true. This person was different than Philip. And the ways that he differed from him might surprise us. In fact, the first and most prominent detail was that he was important, that he oversaw all the money in the Ethiopian kingdom. Let me explain. It says that he oversaw the queen's stash of the money 
here's what's true and most likely uh, realistic in terms of history is in this kingdom at this time, the king didn't really do anything. It was really just the queen that would lead. And so we shouldn't be surprised then that his management of this money, of the queen's money, meant the treasury of really the whole kingdom. He was important. He was wealthy. He was notable. He was famous. And Philip was just Philip. Some other things that are true about him then is that he was seeking truth about God, that he sought to understand the Jewish religion. This person was probably well-traveled. And in a lot of ways, we see this person being someone who's very, uh, very interesting, that he got to probably experience a lot of different people's beliefs and then went to seem to have this religious journey, trying to confirm or to explore, to be curious about things that he was unsure of. And it led him all the way to Jerusalem to see Jewish people worship a God that he wasn't familiar with, and then to leave Another amazingly interesting fact, with a scroll containing a passage from Isaiah 53, something that would have been very expensive and very unique, that this probably wouldn't have been a simple thing to get a hold of, that he obviously cared, that he obviously had a passion and a curiosity for who God was. So what's true about him is that he was important, that he was seeking truth, And then also what's true is that he was victim to a common practice that ensured his loyalty to the current king and queen, something that would have been probably embarrassing to some degree and something that really crippled him in a lot of ways. It made him unsure maybe and even maybe uneasy for himself. However, what really characterized these two people now, this Ethiopian eunuch, was his interest in God. And being obedient to God's plan for him, even without without even knowing, without him being aware, what characterized Philip then was his obedience to God's creative plan. We see this incredible, again, not coincidence of these two people meeting because God told Philip to go south, all for this purpose to, to intersect this person. He went to Jerusalem, he was sitting in the chariot, and he was reading, and then, verse 29, God made it clear what it is Philip should do. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot, stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet, and he asked him a question. I'll get to the question in a second. Um, Really, again, interesting, comical in, in some ways. We see, again, this person, Philip, not knowing who he's trying to meet with, feeling called by God, knowing and being confident in God's creative plan for him, that something was going to happen now that he traveled all this way. He made it down south to this desert road, that there was barrenness, there was nothing there compared to where he came from, which was a successful place, a season of, of excitement and success. And now he, he runs into this person, most likely in either a caravan, uh, definitely pulled by an animal, and Philip on his feet. And so he ran. Despite the possible embarrassment and awkwardness, he heard this person reading aloud, which was a super common practice, Um, to to try to discern how these words sounded and how it worked out. Uh, Most likely, definitely not his native tongue as well, so maybe even translating at the same time. We see that this person was confused. This Ethiopian eunuch had grabbed hold of something that he wasn't sure of. We have two options, really, to think of this Ethiopian eunuch. The first, I think, is really, this, this is where I'm really landing. This is what I think is true. He was either, number one, a God-fearing person who was very weary of the current culture and the way that people interacted with the truth about God. You see, like I said, he was probably well-traveled, someone who really understood and heard from many different perspectives what it is it meant to have a relationship with God. In fact, what really characterized that time and age was a theological indifference. Let me explain what I mean. It didn't really matter what you believed as long as it didn't matter to someone else. It was very commonplace to just have a group of some kind of gods or deities or something that you revered or respected or honored, but as long as you didn't mess with anybody else, we were okay. Does that sound familiar maybe? It was a time of theological indifference, but also of moral ambiguity that it wasn't really crystal clear what's right and wrong. As a direct result of that theological indifference, because there was no standard for good and bad, people had to set it themselves. And so because of that, again, tons of confusion. 
who, who decides? Is it me? Is it God? Is it holy books? Is it, we don't know. Who, how is it that we should decide what's right and wrong? This is what characterized this day and age. Maybe that sounds familiar as well. The last thing is that disadvantaged people were taken advantage of, and he would be one example. The Ethiopian eunuch himself, although he had status, he was still a victim of systems and things that were happening in his life that he, were out of his control. These commonalities with our current time shouldn't surprise us. However, it gives us a unique opportunity to feel and kind of insert ourselves into the situation. Maybe we are like the Ethiopian eunuch, eunuch ourselves. Maybe we feel weary of those things, weary of the lack of standard, maybe even interested. Maybe that's what brought you here today, to feel like you might have some connection or question about what it means to have a relationship with God, about what it looks like to have a closeness with the one who made us. Maybe that's you, and you're seeking out someone who can explain, because that's what happens next. The relief, I'm sure, that this Ethiopian eunuch felt to meet this random person on the road that he, again, just happened to be near, that God all knit together in his creative plan, his day-to-day -day plan, to see someone witness the big, giant plan of salvation that God laid before each one of us as well as the Ethiopian eunuch. He ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah. Do you understand what you're reading? I think he probably knew that he didn't. That was very nice to ask like that. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of Scripture the eunuch was reading. We'll pause there. Again, we see this incredible obedient response. Again, this circumstance that would have been awkward and strange for Philip, this person who just came from the north, who probably by this point I would imagine smelled not too great, um, wasn't really well liked most likely because of his status as someone who was following Jesus, a member of the church, um, that he wouldn't have been well liked or well received probably wherever he went in this entire region. And yet he found who it was that God was, was calling him to go to. This, again, circumstance or coincidence, no way. God being creative and designing this all together to do this incredible thing. So in other words, we can think that God said to do it and Philip just said yes. This incredible obedience because he trusted. He knew and believed that God's creative plan was exactly what it was that God wanted him to do. He was confident that what it was that what God was saying was exactly what Philip should be doing. We can, again, imagine what it would feel like. Oh, that's why I came down here. That's why I traveled all this way. Maybe the relief for Philip also not just to, he gets to not be on his feet anymore. That probably felt really good too. Because he got in the chariot with him and he began to read this passage. Listen to what the Ethiopian eunuch was reading right at this very moment. He was debating maybe with some of his other people, some of the people that are traveling with him. This is what he was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. As a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. This was a prophecy written way before Jesus, and yet spoke with great detail about the sacrifice that would need to happen. Someone needing to pay for a penalty of death that was owed by mankind that the Bible's crystal clear that because we've sinned, done things that don't reach God's standard, that death is what's required. That's the payment for sin. And yet someone would be led like a sheep to the slaughter in our place. What Philip told him about Jesus there, and we see in the next verse, the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Is it himself or is it someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. What a great question. Was, this, was it back then that God did something about my problem of sin? Was it, was it back then when Isaiah was written that God finally sorted this problem out because I know I can't? Philip told him the truth, that just like a lamb of God was slain, we can think of it like this. 
like a mama sheep and her little lamb out in an open field with a bird of prey circling ahead. A mama sheep having the instinct to protect her little one and get in the way of the attack, only to be killed herself. An innocent bystander having to see what was happening went over to the mother lamb to, or mother sheep to see what had happened to find its lifeless body. However, to see movement underneath. Where out from underneath this, this wounded and killed mother sheep came the little lamb, covered in her mother's blood and covered by her sacrifice, escaping death. This destiny that was set for the lamb, as that would have been so much easier for the bird of prey. But in every way, this is the story that we see for us. The lamb of God taking our place, being sacrificed for us. They had the same picture in the Jewish culture in Passover, but this is what he was able to explain, that Jesus paid that price for you and for me a price that was death because of the relationship that was broken when we chose to push God away and to say, I can do this better myself. Covered by Jesus' sacrifice, he paid the debt of death that we owed. The Ethiopian responded in an incredible way, but we stop and pause here just for a minute to ask you, how would you respond? Maybe you've heard this a million times. Maybe you've already chosen to accept what Jesus did for you. Maybe you still have questions. But the reality is this. When we look at this story and we see God orchestrating and putting things together, we can't help but say wow to God's creative power and ability to put these two people together in such a way that makes no sense. These random characters from nowhere coming from different regions of the earth, different regions of the known world, all for an incredible, powerful plan to witness and bear witness to God's big plan of how Jesus came to save. What the Ethiopian, Ethiopian eunuch said then in response, what will stop me? As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here's water. What could stand in the way of my being baptized? He gave orders to stop the chariot. Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. Philip baptized him. Again, this immediate obedient response, right? This incredible time and realization of some of the things that he saw when he was in Jerusalem. Baptism, for example. How would he have known what that was? The Jewish culture had a baptism of their own, one that symbolized something really simple, to, uh, to repent or to stop doing one thing and to change and start living for God's good. But however, this baptism meant something else. It was exactly what we would say now, that because of his belief in Jesus, he was able to go down into the water and identify with Christ's death, Jesus dying in his place, and say, I'm dying to myself. I can't save myself. There's nothing I can do. And then rising up out of the water and saying, no, now I have new life because Jesus has given it to me. Because of his death and his resurrection, I too will be made and brought to new life because of what Jesus did. So remembering where he started, his home being in the desert, into the, the road to Gaza, right, this desert place, desolate spiritually as well. This is where the Ethiopian eunuch was, in a desolate spiritual place, away and broken, separated from God. However, God had a plan to meet him in that desolate place, in that desert, and to bring him to water new life, abundant life, purposeful life. And this is exactly what God intended in every way. We see this incredible opportunity, this incredible example, a picture of God's perfect plan and a witness to God's bigger plan of salvation. It's so amazing to me how we can see this great example and then how it ends is, is even more incredible. The very last verse that we'll talk about today, verse 39, when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. The eunuch didn't see him ever again, but went on his way rejoicing. In just the same way he came, Philip left, being obedient to what God did, answering a simple question that we might have as readers. Why did God call Philip down south? It was for one person, one Philip left success, 
support, help, to travel miles for how many people? How many, church? One. It's unbelievable. It makes no logical sense. However, the more that we think about it, it does make sense because that's me. That's my example that God left everything for me. The same is true for you, that he left perfection for the one. It's you. He would have done the same thing over and over because that's his love for you. This is Philip's story. This is the Ethiopian eunuch. It's, it's us. Now, our response then to that coming, that seeking, the Bible's crystal clear that God is seeking you. He wants all of you because he loves you. He designed you. He made you. Unlike, unlike using the phone to, as a hammer, destroying it, breaking it, we're, we're being destroyed, trying to consider, maybe I'm made for something other than worshiping God. How could I? How could I be using myself for something other than what God made me to be and to do? It leaves us broken, destroyed, just like it would to use my phone as a tool or a hammer. God made us to be close to him, and he's reaching out. He's saying, you're the one. I'm coming for you. This incredible truth and reality leaves us to this broken state. I, I, this is how it leaves me to say, God, what, what now for me? It's now look at Philip. See the obedience. See the response. Being so in tune and close with God that he had no question, I trust your creative plan for my every day. My obedience has no dependence on my circumstance, my season in life. It's not whether it's successful. It's not whether it's fun. It's not whether it's scattered or lonely. God, all the time, I obey this creative plan that you've laid before me. If you tell me to do it, I do it. It's a challenge. Please don't hear me say it's easy. But even when it feels foolish or unproductive or pointless to do the things that we know God has called us to do, that's all the more reason to go and to obey and to trust that this is what's really what God has. Even in the obedience for just the one, because that's what Jesus did for us. Who is the one for you? Who do we need to reach out to? We recognize that Philip was obedient because he knew God. He was confident that this is who God was. He was a fulfilling God who plans and executes the plan, that there was no question if he could trust him. God, are you sure that's what you want me to do? There was no question for him because he saw God do it time and time again. And aside from all that, even besides the proof that God gives us every day, it's just who he is. God doesn't need to prove his faithfulness over and over again. He just is. We can't separate his own faithfulness to his plan. It's his how silly of us to question, God, are you sure? Yes, he is. It's who he is. Not only is he a fulfilling God, but a rescuing one, that he sought me out at the depths of the bottom of the ocean. Sometimes we pretend, like in, in the things that we're dealing with, this, this state between me and God, that maybe I'm just like, I'm just swimming in a current or a stream. God, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. I need my lifeguard to save me. The, the truth is it's so much dire than that, that we are dead the Bible is so clear. That same chapter that our verse of the week was in, in Ephesians 2, it talks about how we were dead in our trespasses and sins. That's bottom of the ocean, all the way down fathoms deep, waiting for something or someone to know that we're even there. God knows. And he reached down, lifted us up, and given us new life. This is our experience. So what are we obeying? What God is it that we obey? not just fulfilling, not just rescuing, but an empowering one as well. An empowering God who informs, who equips, and transforms ordinary people like me. Without him, I, I, I'm nothing. I'm just a, a very shallow cup of trying to, to help other people and to do what I can. But the truth is I need God to do what it is that he has for me. For Philip, this obedience led him to witness God's appointments in his life those little moments that can't be coincidence. Do you ever experience them? Saints who, are, those who have been saved by God, okay, you've been saved for a long time. Isn't it surprising, almost kind of fun, even if it's a challenge? 
I'm talking to you, right? The, the, the people, you've known God for a long time. Isn't it kind of fun to see what God is doing? And like, maybe it's going back years and years, and you're like, oh, like that's why that happened. So I could actually comfort this person, or so I could have a conversation with so-and-so. Maybe that's why I, I lost that job, so that I'd end up here instead. Maybe that's why my, uh, this broken thing happened. For people who are just starting out, maybe you just recently became a Christian, isn't it exciting to see every day that God has something new, a new way to, to, to feel and, and recognize how he's actually planning your life? And for those of you who are searching or seeking him, I want to tell you the truth. This, this is what we were made for, to be obedient to this creative God so that we can see these appointments, we can witness everyday miracles and we can be witnesses of God's faithfulness. And like I said, he doesn't need to prove it. It's just who he is. He does prove it, but he certainly doesn't need to. This is a challenge to continue our VBS program now and, and to really realize, okay, this isn't just for kids. It's for everyone. A creative God who lays out plans for each one of us, this is how powerful and incredible our God is. Will you then... Be willing to say yes to God's plan for you, despite the challenges and despite the things that might be difficult. That's why we have each other. That's why we're together. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for this opportunity to stand by and to witness some of the creative and awesome things that you're doing. Thank you for this past week, and thank you for, um, for again, this opportunity we have, God, to just say wow to you, your creative plan for us, and how much you love us this opportunity we have to recommit ourselves to that plan that you have, because we know this to be true, that we are desperate for you, that you sought me out, you saved me, and you extend that same invitation to each one, no matter the things that I've done, no matter how broken I might feel or be. God, it's you, you restore. God, you're so good. Thank you, Lord.